Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks so much for joining me today. We're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Jennifer Morris. I'm a product evangelist here at Madcap Software. And today I am so thrilled to introduce John Stewart, who's an instructor in technical and professional communication at the University of South uh, Florida, Sarasota, Manatee. Today, John is going to walk us through his journey on adopting Flare and a, and a bit about how he folded it into his program there at the university, which has been hugely beneficial to his students in terms of uh, giving these folks exposure to software and also methodologies that they'll be encountering uh, upon graduation. So welcome, John. Uh, we're so happy to have you with us today to, to share all this uh, great knowledge. I just want to go through a few quick housekeeping tips uh, before we begin. So just a reminder to everybody uh, uh, that this will be recorded. So if you have to pop out early, not a problem. We're going to send everybody a link to the recording when it's done. So if you've registered and you had to leave, we'll, you'll, you'll get a link to everything. So not a problem there. There's also a questions panel in the GoToWebinar console. So if you have any questions as John's presenting, feel free to, to type that in. Or if for whatever reason you can't hear or see the screen, you know, use that and, and we'll do our best to help you behind the scenes. Um, and whatever we can, if there are any questions, we'll, we'll We'll do what we can to get to them. I suspect we'll have enough time, but if we don't, we'll send out a question and answer document to everybody uh, at the end. So feel free to use that. Um, but with that, I just wanted to welcome you again, John. Thanks so much for joining us today. And, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. OK, thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, let's see. Well, my purpose in this presentation is basically just to tell you the story of why I decided to integrate an XML project into my new media course, which is part of the Professional and Technical Communications degree program here at the University of South Florida, Sarasota, Manatee. Um, I want to talk a little bit about why I chose Flare for the authoring tool, uh, explain how we use it in the course, walk through the course materials, the nitty gritty of you know how I actually present this thing on the ground, and talk a little bit about student projects, which are always interesting. Um, Winding up, I'd like to explain what I'm planning to do next with this sort of thing because I am going to keep growing this project and invite people to connect and collaborate on similar sorts of initiatives. Um, in the end, my main purpose is to build bridges between academia and business communities for everybody's uh, mutual benefit. So, um, often, it's a good strategy to begin at the end. And here we see some results of one of the student's projects, which is also just almost painfully cute. But the Beagle Pup project, yes, the students were empowered to choose any topic they wanted. And this resulted in a lot of really interesting content. Uh, one student, obviously, was a fear expert on beagles. And she assembled a guide to adopting and caring for uh, students had to specifically create illustrated procedures because this gives them a way to demonstrate knowledge of using the templates, the type styles, and images. And of course, those of you that are instructors recognize probably a lot of opportunities in that to also teach them about rhetorical and composition uh, principles and practices and theory. Um, they also often created their own images and imported them, as in this example which also um, gives them experience in crafting effective procedures, uh, handling images, learning the importance of clear visuals, and learning how to integrate images with text, all of which, of course, is very important in the tech writing curriculum. Um, the final discussion of the course is always a project evaluation in which the students are asked to reflect on and explain how using tools like Flare is useful in this course, other courses, the job search, and on the job. Uh, students overall have been very good at articulating why this tools-based approach to grounding new media history and theory and practice adds value to their degree. And um, well, these are the kind of comments that I like to see at the end of the course. Um, So why XML and why Madcap Flare? How did this thing get started? Um, well, I had a professional background of 18 years in corporate software documentation. Um, during that time, I was invited to work on an XML contract where I, I was, well, they said, 
can you do XML and can you do modular authoring and do you know anything about Ditta? And at that time, I didn't know anything about any of it. So, of course, I said yes, since I was a contractor. And, uh, well, it took about a week to figure it all out. But one of the things that I got out of that experience was that with a little bit of a little bit of background knowledge that none of this is really rocket science. It's, it's a little bit scary looking at first, but after, uh, after you dig into it, it's not so bad. So that was one of the things that started making me think when I became an instructor, this is something that I could teach the students in a reasonable length of time. Um, anyway, I had several years of experience uh, teaching in a BA program in professional and technical communication at a state university here at USF. Um, I had some considerable experience using and teaching new media, and I started thinking for my new media course about how, how all this new media stuff ultimately kind of rides on top of XML. Um, so it seemed like a logical thing to introduce the students to. And I had a really, really, really serious desire to teach real-world applications of new media background and theory. Uh, increase the student ability to connect theory and practice, to be competitive in the marketplace, and to develop leadership, maybe most important of all, leadership in technical publications best practices. I want my students to be leaders in their field. Flair, I thought, was reasonably easy to learn. It provides really good support, great, go great documentation, and has an educational partnership program. So it, it was a good candidate for the tool. Um, now, a lot of my background was in, you know, actual corporate writing practice. Of course, I had my graduate degree too, but, but I am not a researcher. However, a lot of my reasoning was confirmed in a much more academic way in this very thorough and thoughtful 2017 literature review in technical communication quarterly. And if you're interested in this sort of thing, I would highly recommend that you go out and dig this up and read it or I can send you a copy. I had the good fortune to be invited to serve on a panel with these people and a couple of other instructors and professors. Uh, I think it was at SIGDOC a couple of years ago at Carnegie Mellon University where we talked about the same sort of thing, teaching students about XML and content management. Um, this article discusses and defines new roles for technical communicators, uh, including content strategists, authors, and trainers in a lot of really useful detail and in terms of relevant skills. A um, couple of quotes from the article, and I promise not to read the slides. Um, technology skills are dot, 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 which means to me what they're saying here that the skills students can develop by practicing with, with tools like Flair are valuable even to potential employers who may not have such sophisticated documentation development methodologies in place yet. And I think yet is the key word here because it leads into one of the traits I would like my students to develop, again, which is technological leadership. Quite honestly, I don't see much future in typing endless pages of text in word processing programs, which in my experience is unfortunately fairly common to a lot of technical writing positions. And I think that learning about tools like XML will help students to move in the direction of more technological leadership at an early point in their career so they can move beyond that kind of repetitive work. Um, a couple of really important quotes from the article. Um, some of the more important conclusions here for my purposes, and I, I added the underlines, of course, um, are that new specialists in tech communication who want to innovate and lead the profession need to be introduced to content management skills, including XML authoring, in undergraduate curriculum. This is not graduate stuff, although it could be. And one of the best ways to do this is by building educational alliances between academics and industry. This benefits everybody, including students, the instructors, the university programs, employers, and the software companies. So, how do we use it in the course? The nitty gritty. Since the XML project was designed as a module, it can be inserted into pretty much any tech comm course. It's only a month long. Uh, since the file set is fairly small, the assessment and grading is less about reading lots of content and more about assessing how well the students learn concepts like modular documentation, 
how well they were able to implement them using an actual publishing tool and how well they were able to connect the earlier readings in new media theory and history to concrete multi-channel technical publications project. And those of you who are instructors will appreciate the part about less reading. It's more about assessing their skills that they developed, which is it's a fairly interesting process. Um, since we use the standard templates, we don't need to delve in the course, that is, into the complexities of editing templates. However, this could be easily appended to the project if it were to be extended to an entire course on XML authoring, which is, I believe, something that they propose in that article and something that I'd like to do someday, although it won't be today. Um, the first project of the course asks students to create a WordPress blog where they post their summaries of course readings, practice creating illustrated procedures, and create and post screencasts. This gives them some practice with the part of the web that they commonly see before we start working through what's under the hood, as it were, a big part of which relies on XML. I want them to understand technical communications from the inside out so that they don't just skate on the surface. Students are used to being asked to memorize facts and to compose ideas in writing, but they're not typically asked to learn a complex publications tool. And this challenges them, I've found, to think in ways that helps them to become more confident with their technical abilities. And you'll see this later in some of the student commentary. Um, the amount of content is intentionally fairly minimal. As it says here, um, they're only authoring, let's see, nine modules of 300 to 500 words each, which is fairly light content. Um, this is so that they can concentrate on learning concepts like modular writing, and so they can concentrate on learning the tool like XML and the authoring tool itself. Um, the Beagle Pup Project example pages we saw earlier were part of one of the illustrated procedures. Uh, let's see, that's bullet point, uh, let's see, next to the last one, author content for procedures. Um, and that included a link, that procedure included a link to another module in the project. So I'm interested in encourage them, encouraging them to look at their hyperlinking uh, rhetorically, that is, you know, not just putting in random hyperlinks, but thinking about the meaning and purpose behind them and the audience and the context and all that stuff. Um, so here we are at the real down-to-earthy stuff, the course materials. Um, the high-level overview of the project is laid out very early in the course. It's uh, put into one short paragraph in the course syllabus. I teach this course every spring term, and it's currently 100% online, and probably will remain so for the foreseeable future. Um, now, this is the syllabus calendar, and it's an excerpt of it anyway. This excerpt starts at week nine, so we're right about in the middle of the term, where we're reading about Tim Berners-Lee, um, and the beginnings of the web. We read his original paper where he explained HTTP and all that kind of stuff. And more important, um, we want to look at what web history can tell us about likely future directions for technical communications because I think if you look at the history of the field and the history of new media in general, you can make some pretty intelligent guesses about where it might go. So that's what I'm trying to get the students to think about. Um, the calendar, overall, helps reinforce the feel of the projects as being very business-like, like something that they might actually encounter out in the field uh, with hard deadlines, multiple review cycles and iterations of their projects, and specific deliverables all along the way. And we'll take a look at those a little bit more as we move on. Um, this is the the detail project document is the other component of the actual documents that the students get. Um, and that provides overview information for both the project and for the new concepts that students are expected to learn and apply. The concepts of modularity, 
modular authoring, that is, single sourcing and XML authoring are expanded on in the weekly readings and discussions from this point forward to the end of the course when the project is due. And you can see at the bottom of the page there, it starts to explain modular doc. And I think um, there's about one more page in that document that is taken up by explanations of those three concepts. So they get kind of a, a general overview of it, and then we delve into the details as we move along through the rest of the course. Um, students not only read about these concepts, but they're also required to demonstrate a concrete understanding of them in their projects, which I think is really what makes this different uh, than most courses they've encountered. And they've consistently said that. They've never seen this kind of thing before. Most of them like it, though. Students consistently comment in their end-of-course reflection posts that using a tool like Flair helps them to understand the connections between the often abstract concepts and the reality of what it means to apply them to solving real-world communications problems and, of course, technical communications problems in specific. Um, currently, I think I mentioned this already, the course is 100% online, always has been and probably always will be. And it's delivered primarily using Canvas as the Learning Management System, or LMS. Um, this view of the course in Canvas shows the first few modules. I put the reference materials for Flare and other need-to-know materials right up front. Um, and you can't see the rest of the course, but it's basically organized by week. It, it reflects the structure of the syllabus calendar pretty much exactly. Um, the tutorial page includes descriptions of each tutorial's content, and this is the main way that I deliver how-to content to the students to instruct them in how to use Flair and how to plug it into the project. Uh, the tutorial page includes descriptions of each tutorial's content plus links to the tutorials, and I think, I think there's about half a dozen of them or something like that. Um, Creating them, the tutorials are produced using Screencast-O-Matic, which is available in both free and very low-cost versions. And I, if you haven't used it, I highly recommend this tool because it's incredibly easy to use, it's incredibly cheap, and it does a better job on the output as far as resolution than some other much more expensive tools that I've tried out, and it's also a lot easier to use. But it's a great way to create content to the students. Uh, the screencast. Uh, John, sorry, John, oh. sorry to start to interrupt. Maybe um, the the audio is a little tricky. Um, if you wouldn't mind, maybe talking a little bit closer to your mic, just so that we can hear. Um, it, it's. I think it's the go to meeting a connection. Okay. So, Paul, okay, sorry, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> no, that's all right. Um, I'll try to get closer to the mic. This is so. This is a screencast-o-matic interface. It's very simple. It's really easy to learn. And in this course, the students use it early in the first project to create their own screencast to post to their blogs. And I use it to create the Flare tutorials. Now, Flare already provides really excellent tutorials on their website. Uh, so my tutorials concentrate on connecting the tool functions to the specific requirements for the project. So they're, they're very project specific. And there's the web address for Screencast-O-Matic if you're interested. Um, the weekly Canvas modules each include a reading section in which the students are assigned a tutorial to view for that week. So the viewing the tutorials is part of the readings for the course. So some of it's actual paper-based reading and some of it's video. Um, the tutorials, and this shows a pretty typical view of what the students are going to see in the screencast that I produce. Um, there I am down in the bottom corner. Um, they usually start with an overview of what's going to be covered, and then they go into a live demo of whatever procedure we're covering, including an audio narrative. So the demos usually so show some kind of a process, like here I think I must be showing them something about how to insert uh, visuals and resize them and that sort of thing. Um, and then they generally will show the results in the uh, Flare viewer where you can see 
for example, here, this is a preview of how the HTML5 output for the example project would look after it's generated. So one of the things I try to get across to the students here is that you need to go into the tool and author and generate and see what it looks like and then go back and change things. And that kind of iterative authoring, fixing things, tweaking them to make them look like you want them to is a good way to learn the tool. Um, Backing up just a little bit, students author a short proposal for their projects as a way for them to learn the basics of proposal writing as well as to lay out a concrete plan for moving forward. And I found that this really helps them get their ideas straight and like early on in the project declare what they're planning to do. Um, so there's two peer review cycles in the project to give the students lots and lots of experience with the review process because I think it's very important and this is the closest thing we're doing right now to actual collaborative writing. Um, but they do review each other's work at least twice and um, one of the things that we do in this process is to model how to construct a useful peer review which uh, seems to help them a lot because a lot of them have absolutely no idea how to comment on someone else's work. So this is also a good work skill to develop and the review questions all point back to the project requirements. So everything's very structured and very easy to understand as long as everybody's paying attention. Um, and incidentally, it, uh, it's also an easy way to see who isn't paying attention. Um, a slight return to the beagles then. Um, student projects. This is the TOC and first few pages of the PDF output using one of the standard Flare templates. Uh, Flare generates the bookmarks automatically and this example shows a good usage of student created visuals, content, and bullet points. And one of the things that I found the students really like about the project is they're authoring in this kind of weird modular environment and uh, in fact I asked them to actually author it in the raw XML view, not in the uh, reader view, so that they can see the code. So they get used to looking at code, so they're not so afraid of it anymore. And it's kind of magical to them when they run their projects through the generators and it generates content and they can see their HTML5 output with the uh, hyperlinks and they can see their bookmarks get generated automatically and stuff like that and it looks really nice when it comes out and I think a lot of them are very surprised at it when they say that. Um, another project, here's another example of what somebody did. This one documented how to use WordPress which reflected back on the first project where the students created their own blogs. Um, a couple of pages from the WordPress tutorial project showing another way to approach illustrated procedures. So this student, rather than doing a physical world project like the Beagles, um, this shows more of a software documentation virtual world type project which incorporates screenshots. So um, I show them a green shot which is another really great application that's free. Uh, and they can uh, download that and install it very easily and they can take screenshots and mark them up and there's there's lots of ways to do this but GreenShot is the tool that I typically suggest that they try out and um, I think the students are kind of evenly divided more or less between doing things that are kind of like this like some sort of software documentation project and some kind of a real world project like I've had students do uh, one student did a manual about how to enter a beauty pageant uh, another one did a manual about how to visit Disney World efficiently and effectively and uh, it's just all over the map so there's a lot of interesting content that comes out of this and whether they're doing something in the virtual world like this or whether they're doing something in the real world, quote, real world, like the Beagle Project, they're still employing all the same skills and as far as the rhetorical stuff that they learn and the skills with the tools, it all ends up being the same. So uh, it's good to see all this variety of content that they generate. Um, now, separate from that reflection post that I asked them to create at the end of the project, 
when the students turn in the final project, they're asked to write a brief commentary, just a couple of hundred words, to contextualize their project and to comment on how they feel about it overall. And I, I know I said I wasn't going to read any of the slides, but I, I would like to read a little bit of this one. I'm amazed at how firmly WordPress and Madcap Flare fit into my definition of new media. And I've learned things that I knew one could do, but never imagined I would be able to do in such a short span of time. And I think this goes back to what I was saying at the very beginning. Can you teach? I, I thought a lot about this before I jumped off of this cliff, like I was wondering if it was possible and realistic to teach students this stuff in a month. And as you can see, it seems to work. Uh, they don't think they can do it at first, but with a little bit of help, they're able to do it. Uh, you can see at the bottom of this commentary the path to their HTML5 output. Now, up until now, we've been doing that by putting it on some of our local servers, but I'm going to be moving to a different model for that pretty soon, uh, as I'll get to in a moment. Um, let's see. One of the main things that students come away with from this project is an increased sense of confidence in their technical abilities. In other words, it's not rocket science. And like they say here, i got to read this one too. Ultimately, I wanted to choose a project that displays just how much I've learned in the course and hope that it encapsulates both my um, awe and embrace of new media as well as my newfound confidence in mastering it. And that's what I really like to see the students say, is that they're a lot more confident in their abilities than when they rolled into the class. Often, Students who have a hard time with the project up front end up really enjoying it. This was, I believe, the student that did the manual on uh, how to enter a beauty pageant. So let's say this was not a typical techie student. But as they say here, they actually liked it. This project was incredibly fun. Um, I'd like to see more of that kind of thing. But uh, I see it often enough, so people actually enjoy working with these tools. They're a little bit intimidated by them at first, and then you can show them that it's all quite doable, and they see the magic of the content being generated, and they realize that all this is very doable. Um, again, I think a lot of them feel that it's increased their confidence in their skills. Um, so, we're sort of drifting towards the end of the presentation here. I'm, I'm maybe a little bit, well, a little bit shorter on content than uh, I thought, but um, where do we go from here? Um, I'm going to continue refining the project instructions and tutorials because there's just no final endpoint where they're as good as they'll ever be. They can always be better. The screencasts, uh, streamlining the instructions, um, you know, just in general trying to think, oh, how better to relate it and connect it to the course materials like the theory and history readings, uh, things of that nature. Um, FTP and FileZilla on a local server were used in the past for students to be able to upload their HTML5 output so that we could see their web output because this is a multi-channel publishing project. I'm, I'm not sure if that was clear from the materials, but um, at the end of the project they have to put out both PDF and HTML5 output. And of course there's a lot of other outputs that they could do like ebooks or whatever, but I just chose those as being something that would be the most versatile sorts of outputs that would be a good way to introduce them to the tool. Um, but we found that the um, FileZilla server client setup was a little bit tricky to set up and a little bit of trouble to maintain and the students were, they had a little bit of a hard time with it too. So the plan is moving forward to add Madcap Central to the project, and that is going to allow people to do a couple of things. They'll be able to publish their web output a lot easier than with FileZilla, um, although I'll miss FileZilla just a little bit. And it'll also introduce the possibility of collaborating more on project deliverables. Now this is something 
that I have tried to do in various technical communications courses in the past, and uh, a lot of it's been online, and a lot of it's been very challenging. Students have had an incredibly hard time working together on projects, in my experience. And so I think the, um, the possibilities posed by using a tool like uh, Madcap Central, where they've actually got a central uh, technology hub where they can share comments comments and documents and all that sort of thing. I think that's going to really help facilitate this. And as we all know, um, collaborative work is pretty essential in the workplace, even though it seems to be a rather difficult thing to introduce in the curriculum. Um, it's certainly something that every employer I've ever talked to values. So that is something that I'm looking forward to expanding on as I make this project a little bit better. And finally, the last thing is to get a little bit more sleep because, um, well, as you can imagine, there's a little bit more work involved with this than just saying, read the book and write a couple of papers and uh, here's your grade at the end of the day. Um, it requires a little bit more of a commitment to the technology, but really not that much more. Um, if you've got some good models to follow, and you've got some good support and you begin building some academic uh, and uh, business alliances, you can start to kind of pave the way for it to be a little bit easier. And uh, again, like with most projects, it's an ongoing project, you know, it's never really going to be finished. So let's see, I think that may bring us pretty much to the end of things, so I believe I need to call on my host to come I'm, back. Yes, thank you, John. I'm I'm here. That was that was great. So um, before we get that, we we have a few questions funneling in. If you can think of anything, feel free to use that questions panel and uh, type in your questions, and we'll get to them here in just a second. But I just want to remind everybody that uh, John mentioned this. We do have our Madcap Scholar program. So if there are any educators. Um, or students on who want to learn more about this program and how we can help get involved and, um, and, and provide the software for the labs and for the students, um, feel free to drop me a line and there's some information on our website um, and we're happy to help you out. And um, you can go to our, our um, madcapsoftware.com and you can actually just search on, on Madcap Scholar Program and, and the link will come up. Um, or you can get in touch with me I'll be sending out my, my email to everybody, and, and I'm happy to, to answer any questions. Um, one last slide I want to just bring up and, and talk about quickly is Mad World. And so quick slide on that, John, if you wouldn't mind. Oh, Sorry about that. Sorry. Yeah, I'm that's okay. Right. There we go. There we go. So just a reminder, we do have our user conference coming up. So if there are any educators or um, folks that are also in the corporate world who want to join us and learn more about best practices, tips and tricks, sessions on, on tool agnostic type subjects, things that just relate to tech comm and methodologies, uh, methodologies, methodologies, excuse me, in general, uh, we'll be hosting our user conference June 3rd through the 6th. Um, here in San Diego at the beautiful Hotel Dell. So there's lots of information online. Students can actually register at a discount. So if anybody has students that are interested in coming and learning, um, they do get a bit of a break on, on their registration. All of that pricing information is online. Um, okay, so I want to see if you could maybe get your contact slide up there, John, so that if anybody wants to jot down uh, your, your details yes. and get in touch with you afterward, they can. Um, uh, there is. Yes, wonderful. Um, and so I just want to kind of address a, a couple questions coming in. Um, one question, was there, were there any other tools that were reviewed or used in the past? You know, did, you, did you look at anything else or were you using anything prior to using Flare? As a matter of fact, yes. Um, there was a couple of, well, uh, and this goes back to uh, back when I was actually in the field. Uh, the, project where I was initially introduced to XML authoring was uh, they used Oxygen and I believe back in those days Oxygen may have been a, a f uh, open source uh, freeware although it isn't anymore. Um, I used it with the students for a couple of terms and it worked pretty well but I think that Flare is easier to learn, the documentation is better, it's a less intimidating looking tool um, there was just a lot of reasons why I felt like, and also I think you guys have a much better, um, you know, partnership program in place. Um, 
So there was a lot of reasons why I felt like it would work better for the students. I think they're both very good tools, uh, possibly with slightly different flavors. I think oxygen might be more suited for really hefty DITA applications, but FLARE is much more suitable for a wider range of project types, which again is a good reason to use it. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and also when you when you call or email MADCAP from a support standpoint, we we do call back and we do email back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Great response. Sorry. I couldn't help but I couldn't I couldn't help but plug it. Um, <laughs> and another Another great question. Um, you were early on in the presentation. You had um, alluded to certain textbooks and materials that you were using. Could you could you review the textbooks and and the additional support resources that you use in class? Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. I had to walk across the room for a minute. Um, yeah. This the text that I'm using right now is from Oxford University Press. It's called Communication, New Media, and Everyday Life. And if you want to shoot me an email, I'll send you the bibliographic information if you can't find it. But I selected that text because it's just a very good overview of uh, new media theory. Now, in addition to that, I've got about four or five articles that I pulled out of a reader, which is called, surprisingly or not, the New Media Reader. And that is from MIT Press. That's an older text, but it's got a lot of historical new media info. Like, for example, it's got the paper written by Tim Berners-Lee, where he explains how he basically came up with HTTP and the other things that make the web run. And the nice thing about the new media reader is that it also includes uh, contextualizing commentary so you can understand these papers and why they're important. So I have the students read four or five of those up front. Great. And again, if you want, if you want the info for that stuff, just, you know, shoot me an email and I'll send you the info. Yeah. The list. Your email's up there for everybody. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then another good question, um, have you heard from any students that had, that used Flare here in, in their post-graduation jobs? Have you had any follow-up from anybody yet? Have any, has anybody commented on their, on their use of Flare in their, in, in the post-graduation work? No, and that's an, actually a really good question because one of the things that we've tried to do here at, at our, in our program is, is to follow up with our grads and find out how they're doing out in the field, you know, uh, what sorts of jobs they end up with, uh, what kind of skills they're using, did they use the skills that they got in the program, and um, it's turned out to actually be pretty challenging um, to gather that kind of data, but we're, we're getting better at it. Um, I can't say that we have a specific example of a student who can say that they've gone into a position and they are definitely using flair, but that's not to say that they aren't out there because, again, our data on this is pretty spotty, which is another area I'd like to improve on. So more, more will be revealed. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, quick question about screencast. Does screencast have an automatic transcript function? Because uh, the comment is we're not allowed to post video without a transcript for accessibility reasons. That's a good question. Ah, uh, that's actually a really good point. Um, I, you know, I don't know. It may or may not. I can tell you that the paid-for version, which is really cheap, may have that ability. I've just never tried to use it. Although, that's a really good point, and I think that would be a good direction to go in the future because accessibility is extremely important, and I'd like to address that going forward, which would be a good thing to make the students aware of as well. So, good point. Not sure how best to do that, but stay tuned. I mean, if if you give me a week, I'll figure it out. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, another question comment that the Flare interface does not require users to think about the XML behind the scenes. Did the students need to do anything that required learning to use the XML outside of the Flare interface? So maybe maybe referring to when you have them use the the, the text editor internal to Flare, perhaps. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I quite understand that comment because it seems to me that when they um, when they use the text editor, in other words, they're seeing the XML code as they're creating it. 
um, creating the text, that is, the files, the XML files, it seems to me that's pretty behind the scenes. I mean, I don't know, I, I'm not sure how much more behind the scenes uh, they need to go than that. Um, and I think, too, that maybe, and, and, and I think everybody learns differently, and maybe you found that students took to it differently, as, and, and some required a little bit more time, but the text editor does allow them to, or anybody really that's using it, to do a split screen. So you can see the visual editor plus the, the text editor side by side. So as you're working and perhaps looking at that text view, you can see it rendering in the visual editor and seeing how those things take effect. You know, what, what happens when you put things between the P tags? Um, and so uh, yeah. you can see it live. Good point. Well, that and one of the things that I do in the instructional, the screencast videos, the tutorials, is that I show them, you know, I'll, I'll author, typically I will emphasize authoring in the text editor. And then I'll say, okay, now you click on the, um, the reader tab and you can see what things are going to look like more or less when they publish. Not, not exactly. It's not the same as seeing the generated content, but it is different. But I switch back and forth between those views fairly often in the tutorials. Good. Um, yeah, here's an interesting question. So um, is there a process and practice for pitching schools to have such curricula and programs? That's a great question. I'm um, going to answer that one. <laughs> well, not that I know of. I mean, my experience, and let me just go back to, if I may, that article that I introduced at the beginning, the 2017 TCQ article. Um, at the end, and they, they mentioned what we're doing here at USF in one or two places. One of the points that they made was that there was only about half a dozen people that they could identify, and they did a massive literature search. Um, in the whole country, they found about half a dozen people that could actually provide some pedagogical materials for this sort of thing. Um, so my feeling about all this, I've been plugging at this for quite a while, this idea of introducing tools to courses like this, and it's, it's not something very many places are doing. And I think it's, it's something that's really poised to explode, I think, um, it just needs to mature a little bit more. Um, as far as I know, there is no organized way for, for uh, pitching this, as you say, to schools, but probably the best way is to just introduce people and have them talk and explain their experiences, and I'd be glad to do that. If anybody wants me to chat with anybody about how this works, I'd be happy to do it, because my main interest is seeing more people adopt this sort of approach. Right, and, and if I can be of assistance as well, I'm happy to provide any information from the MADCAP side uh, to, if you've got interested parties, if you're curious about it, how our scholar program can help in terms of getting um, the licenses in, in the lab or perhaps in the hands of the students individually if it's, if it's more of a distance learning kind of situation as well. Um, Here's a good question. Can you expand on MADCAP Central and what is it and how does it work? Is, is it accessible and included in the scholar program? And maybe the two of us can answer that one. John. <laughs> um, yeah, that makes more of a question for you, I think. Um, yeah, and, and I can take that one. So, so MADCAP Central is our web-based content management platform that we introduced um, last year and, it's, and it, it provides a way for not only in the educational space, but even in the corporate world, if you're using it in, you know, in, in, the, in, in the corporate world too, how to uh, manage your projects, how to plan, how to, how to track your progress on projects, collaborate amongst the different users who are involved in the overall documentation process. Um, so there's a whole project management aspect to it. MADCAP Central offers integrated source control so that you don't have to rely on your IT teams to get you set up with a source control platform and get everything configured. As a, as a writing team, you, you can be much more self-reliant to get that set up and going yourself. It also provides a way to manage your project builds, so programmatically scheduling and building all of your content 
uh, on the cloud. Um, maybe you want things to happen, you know, build nightly. You don't, again, you don't have to rely on your IT team to get a, a staging server set up, another build license configured, batch files configured to run things using the command line. It's super easy. There's a UI to, to schedule all these things, and you can do all this by yourself. And then it, it also provides a, 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 an option for project hosting. So if you want to use it as an integrated web server, again, no reliance on your IT team to get you set up with that kind of technology. You can do it all yourself. Um, I mean, it's it's so. I know that somebody else coined this, but it's so easy. A caveman can do it. So um, it, it's a lot of fun to use, and it, it really makes you, as the authoring team, much more self reliant to manage all these processes yourself. Um, so if you're interested, reach out to me, and we can certainly get you set up as part of the scholar program with Central. Uh, that's something that we do offer. Um, so in addition to, so hopefully that helps, and again, reach out, and I'm, I'm happy to, to help with, with more information there. And I think you're, you mentioned, John, you're going to be folding that into your curriculum a bit more, um, perhaps in the coming future. Uh, that would be my plan for the next time around, uh, which I guess, well, gosh, that will be in spring, uh, which spring. is coming, coming up. up rather quickly. So I guess I better get busy. But one of the <laughs> things that you said there was real important, uh, the part about you don't have to rely on IT for help with a lot of this, because we have uh, leaned on some of our IT folks for help uh, for parts of this stuff and it's a bit of a problem because um, there's really not a whole lot of money you know to spend on this kind of thing at least not at our institution and um, the IT staff tends to be stretched pretty thin anyway so relying on them for support is like even with the best of intentions, it's not something that I like to do. I like to have as much control over it uh, myself as possible. So uh, again, that's another reason and motivation for moving to Madcap Central for uh, publishing the web output. Wonderful, yeah. Um, and another good question, so we, we talked about Flare, you, you talked about Screencast, talked a little bit about Madcap Central. The question is, what other software do you use in the new media course? Um, well, we start them off uh, with WordPress, building blogs, and we introduce them to Screencast-O-Matic for making screencasts, and they use Flare to create their multi-channel publishing project. And, um, well, that's really about it. That's about all we have time for. I suppose I could stuff some more things in there, but I think that our uh, discussion about introducing them to Madcap Central, that is going to be the next piece of the puzzle. And I think uh, that's probably enough for 16 weeks. Yeah, indeed. Um, another good question. Uh, would students be good evangelists for introducing Flair and other tools at their schools, especially where funding is limited? Um, my, my opinion on that great question is absolutely. Um, and, and anything we can do to give them information on how to get it you know, in front of the professors and the stakeholders who are in charge of these things, we'd be happy to help. What are your, what are your thoughts, John? Oh, absolutely. And I mean, that just makes me think of some of our initiatives, like some of our students that are current students and some of the ones that have graduated. Uh, we've had them write, uh, you know, success stories about their experiences at the institution and their experiences post-graduation. And um, a lot of times they'll talk about their learning experiences and what facilitated those. And, of course, they mention stuff like this, you know, if they took a course where they got to use a tool that helped them to get a job or that they're able to promote to their current employer. Uh, those are the sorts of things that we encourage them to talk about. So that's one of the channels we're using for, you know, our students to talk to other students. Wonderful. That's terrific. Well, I, have, I think we're kind of topping off at the, at the hour here, so I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, really appreciate the discussion and the questions that came in. I think this was wonderful information. John, thanks so much for taking the time with us. Um, as mentioned, we, we are recording this, so we'll send out a link to the recording to everybody. Uh, also, a follow-up on the question and answer document so that everybody can get that as well. Um, feel free to reach out to John if you have any questions about what was covered today or myself, and I'm, I'm, I'll send out a... Um, my uh, information uh, on the follow-up too. So 
thanks everybody again for coming. Thank you, John, and uh, we hope you all have a wonderful rest of the week and hope to see you on another webinar soon. So take care, everybody. Uh, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.